AR-15s, shotguns, tons of pistols, semi-automatic handguns, also bear spray, chemical spray, stun guns, flagpoles, spears, flagpoles made into spears, clubs, collapsible batons, bulletproof vests, um, crossbows, machetes, smoke grenades, thousands of rounds of ammunition ranging from shotgun shells to hollow point bullets. Plus the nightmare homemade stuff, like these mason jars filled with gasoline and styrofoam. Basically do-it-yourself napalm. Nice that he packed them all together in that tight space. Hit any speed bumps on the way? On Friday, just a few days ago, uh, the Washington Post did a public service. Um, they set several reporters to pull from court filings and public reporting all of the different weapons we now know we're at the Capitol on January 6th in the hands of the pro-Trump mob. Post reported on 121 people ultimately charged with using or carrying dangerous weapons that day. That reporting, of course, follows testimony from White House staffer Cassidy Hutchinson that not only was President Trump warned early on January 6th that the crowds near the Capitol were quite heavily armed, that the people choosing to go through the metal detectors had had tons of weapons confiscated from them already. But he was warned that the people choosing not to go through the metal detectors were choosing to avoid them, choosing to avoid going through magnetometers, in part because they wanted to keep their weapons on them. Trump responded to that information, allegedly, by saying that he wanted the metal detectors for his rally taken down so the crowd wouldn't have to have their guns taken away for them to be able to attend. Because whoever they wanted to use those weapons against, he figured it wasn't him. I overheard the president say something to the effect of, you know, I, I don't effing care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Take the effing mags away. Let my people in. They're not here to hurt me. Let the people in with weapons. And then we'll go to the Capitol. Again, um, we have known that information for a couple of weeks because of testimony from White House staffer Cassidy Hutchinson. But that information we can now put in the context of a whole burst of new news about just how armed the crowd was on January 6th. I mean, first we learned from her that Trump knew they were armed. Now we're learning a lot more about how exactly they were armed and how armed they were. I mean, in addition to that Washington Post reporting, which is a real public service, on Friday from the Justice Department, we also got an update in the seditious conspiracy case against the leaders of the Oath Keepers, um, and alleged members of that group. U.S. prosecutors laid out a series of revelations about weapons they say those individuals had brought with them to D.C. on January 6th. Quote, the government has evidence that members of the group from Florida and Arizona allegedly staged semi-automatic rifles and other weapons in a suburban Washington hotel, while a third team from North Carolina kept their firearms ready to go in a vehicle in the parking lot. Quote, another Florida member of the group came to Washington with explosives in his recreational vehicle, which he left parked in College Park, Maryland. The government later seized from that RV, quote, military ordnance grenades. He had them in his RV, which he had used to travel to D.C. on January 6th. All of that is information. I think it's worth noting. That is all information we did not have the first time anybody tried to hold Trump accountable for what he set off on January 6th. During his second impeachment trial right after January 6th, one of the key pieces we now know was missing was just how armed that crowd was when they stormed the Capitol. That makes this kind of fresh new ground. How does it change the job of the investigators? How does it change the, the stakes? Well, joining us now is somebody in a, in a unique position to be able to talk about that. Barry Burke was counsel to the House Judiciary Committee during President Trump's first impeachment, the one about Ukraine. Then he was lead counsel in President Trump's second impeachment, which was the one about January 6th. Mr. Burke, it is a real pleasure to have you with us here tonight. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Rachel. Great to be here. Is it fair to say um, that when Trump was impeached for the January 6th attack, again, for which you were lead counsel, is it fair to say that it wasn't yet clear at that time just how many weapons were among the mob that day, how many weapons, what types of weapons they had brought to D.C., let alone the fact that, that Trump was aware of how armed they were? That is all true. This is so much more direct evidence that supports everything we were saying during the impeachment, seeking to prove, and all the circumstantial evidence that we thought proved it. It also shows the lies to all of Trump's defenses. If you remember, during the impeachment, we had him saying to the Proud Boys, stand back and stand by. We had him sending out on December 19th the tweet, 
you know, big protest in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. It will be wild. And we had all the other evidence. What this shows is that everything we were saying was true and then some. Of course, he was summoning these violent domestic extremist groups and should have known and would have known that they were violent. When he stood up there, he knew the crowd that he was encouraging because he had received those warnings. Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony was so great because it explained what preceded it and what followed. He knew they had guns, but didn't care because they weren't seeking to shoot him. And all these folks came prepared. And there's even more evidence of that because they were told the election was being stolen and they were summoned there. And I remember from the second impeachment, one of the most chilling pieces of film that I saw when preparing was the film when the people who raided it told the police, we're here because the president told us to come here and invited us. Mm. And that's what they believe. And that's why he is singularly responsible. So it is new evidence and it's powerful further proof of his responsibility for everything that happened and that January 6th was the culmination of his attempt to interfere with the peaceful transfer of power after all his other efforts had failed. Now, in, in terms of the relationship between these pro-Trump fascist paramilitary groups, um, members of which have been charged with seditious conspiracy, and the culpability of the president, Congressman Raskin, who's going to co-lead tomorrow's hearing, I know you, you worked with him closely on, on Trump's second impeachment, he has said that tomorrow's hearing is not going to be about showing explicit evidence that Trump, you know, approved directly of these paramilitary groups' plans or that he told them to draw up plans like that. He said that isn't what they're setting out to prove. They're setting out to prove what he described as, as a convergence of Trump's efforts and what the paramilitary groups are willing to do with weapons and with with violence. Can you help us understand what that what that means? He's not talking about there being coincidentally pursuing the same idea. He's talking about there being converged efforts. Absolutely. And I think I can't help but look at this as a trial lawyer, because it's so effective to have Cassidy Hutchinson come in as the last witness, say she heard Proud Boys, Oath Keepers mentioned in connection with January 6th. They knew they were warned there was going to be violence. They knew and he was warned not to use the words to, to encourage the crowd to fight. And yet he sent out, you know, that Jan the December 19th tweet telling him to be there and be wild. He knew what he was coming. So they're not going to say that he may have had direct conversations with the Oath Keepers or the Proud Boys, but it was all happening in real time. At the same time, he was trying to influence state officials, telling him to find the exact amount of votes he needed to win, trying to get his senior DOJ officials just to say, just say there's fraud and he'll take care of the rest. It was clear that these efforts were part of that broader scheme. So I think what Jamie, who's the best, was trying to say is they may not need to show and they won't show a direct communications, but they don't need to because the proof is overwhelming that these were all part of the same efforts to prevent the peaceful transfer of power, to interfere with the work of Congress. And he shouldn't, shouldn't have been surprised that when you're reaching out, telling the Proud Boys to stand back and stand by, when you know these folks are hearing your messages, that they will be armed and heavily armed. He just didn't care because they weren't there to harm him. Yeah, it was a unified, holistic effort where everybody was aware of all of the other elements of the effort. And one of the elements of the effort were heavily armed, paramilitary trained um, fascist groups. You know, just another day at the office. Um, Barry Burke. I think it's cool. Yeah. Sorry. I, just, uh, I think it's so important because it adds the violence to it that he knew. That's right. And that's something that the American people can understand. The violent overthrow of government is something that we've never seen, let alone by a president of the United States. So to see those efforts, I think, really speaks volumes. And it'll be a continuation of that tomorrow at the hearings. Barry Burke was lead counsel for Trump's second impeachment on these matters. Barry, thank you for helping us at the stage for that tomorrow. It's really great to have you here. Thanks, Richard.